Hi everyone, good to see you today. I've got the camera pointed down at the book a little bit here so you can see it really well. And um, I've got everyone on Facebook, so uh, welcome to our Philosophical Geometry class today. Um, first of all, hope you all had a nice weekend and uh, are ready for this class today. I've got something kind of uh, unique that we're gonna go through today that relates to some work I've been doing over the weekend. I've been kind of quiet uh, on Instagram and everything lately because I've been pretty much 100% consumed on a, a project that is turning out to be something quite interesting indeed. And I'm gonna be taking you through that uh, today. And so that's why I have this, uh, this uh, drawing that I made some time ago on the solar system, which you might think, what the heck does that have to do with anything? And people ask me all the time, they're like, hey, you know, what's the practical application of geometry? Well, pretty much everything. It is everything around us. And the only limitation you can place on geometry is that limitation that you can conceive in your own mind. There are no limitations to it, in fact. But um, one of the things I wanted to point out to you guys today was if you can see here on this particular thing, it's harder for the people on Instagram, but I'll just walk you through it. I'll speak you through it as well. Um, this is my notebook from some time ago. And um, I was having a hard time using this paper anymore, so I decided not to. Really, the compass destroys this, this kind of paper, this cloth paper. But um, I wanted to just let you guys in on this secret, which is, it's not really much of a secret anymore, that the planets in the solar system are each a musical note and therefore they have a resonance frequency. And the musical notes are captured right here. And based on the work that I had uh, done before, uh, all of it relates back to this particular mathematical equation. Two of the fundamental math constants, which are Euler and pi, create light, they create all life, and you add one to that and you have Euler divided by pi plus one equals the speed of light in miles. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute, the mile measurement and everything is, is not fundamental. Uh, actually, it is. If you measure the Planck length in miles, it comes out to unity. So it's one uh, times 10 to the negative 38th power is the Planck length when measured in miles, uh, which is kind of fascinating because how did that happen? Isn't the mile supposed to be old and isn't that based on the Roman step and all this stuff? Well, actually, no. There's a great video that... that uh, that my colleague Alan Green did, which basically demonstrates how uh, the mile, the inch, the foot, the meter, all of which in the cubit were built fundamentally into the Great Pyramid. And so given that the Great Pyramid is the oldest building we have on the planet, it's still a standing structure, um, somehow it had embedded within it all of these fundamental ratios that are perfect. And, um, and it, the evidence is beyond compelling. It's, it's really, really astounding. And so when I started noticing, I guess when I started to finally, I guess, wake up to these types of things, I noticed that the sun had a very unique radius and that that radius happened to relate uh, to light speed. And, and the, the sun's radius, and of course, that's where we get most of our light from, is from the sun. So the sun's radius is, uh, is 432,000 miles and some change, 432,000 miles. And even the sun's circumference and diameter and everything has very, very small changes uh, from day to day. And you can even track it. I've been tracking it on what Google says it is. But 432 is definitely an important number to remember. And it also becomes a tuning standard. So it's the note A. Um, and it also becomes a full-on tuning standard for all music uh, that would be what's referred to as 432 hertz tuned music. And, and what we find is that when you switch to a 432 standard, everything has a digital root of nine, so everything sums to the number nine, so four plus three plus two equals nine, and 432 is a Pythagorean uh, you know, combination of numbers. It's called a, a kind of like a Pythagorean triplet, right? Um, and, and so basically, when, when you think about Pythagorean triplets, you're thinking about triangles, right? Triangles that, that come together. And, and so you've got, so this phone call someone's trying to make with me. 
Um, so basically, you've got these numbers that are always summing to the number nine. And with this number nine matrix type system, you'll notice also that the diameter of the Earth also sums to the number nine, which is 7,920 miles. And that's also a musical note. 7,920 is gonna give us uh, roughly a note, if I remember correctly here, it's gonna give me a G sharp. So it gives me a G sharp note, which is fascinating because it's like, well, wait a minute, G sharp would also give us the color green and green is kind of like what we see with, you know, what comes onto the earth. Uh, but it also has its absorption color, which would be its opposite. And that's gonna be more like a reddish brown color. So, the interesting part about this, you'll notice that the colors of the planets all do match kind of a rainbow spectrum. Um, and you've got kind of the blues and the violets uh, out on the, the far end of the, of the solar system. And I know I've showed you this before, but there's a reason why I'm bringing you back to this. Because this was a fundamental piece of when I understood that reality and how we perceive it is not exactly as we have been or, or as we have believed. I don't really want to say led to believe because I think if anyone's doing the leading, it's ourselves. So the sun has a diameter then of 864,000 um, and change miles. So 864,600, 700 miles, something in that zone. And, um, and, and basically these numbers were numbers that I just kept remembering over and over and over again. Now, just keep that in your mind, 432, 2592, 25,920, which is the precession of equinox. Keep in your mind also that the number of days in the Jovian year is 4,320 days in the Jovian year, which turns out to be 11.86 years of Earth time. And, and all of these relationships are relationships that are, you know, kind of tied to the previous planet and to the next planet, just like geometries. So the distances they are from the planets and even Earth's radius from the sun is 93 million miles. If we double that, we come back to 186 million miles, which matches the 18.6 miles per second the Earth is moving. And, and recognize, therefore, that you know, even the moon has a note, which is 2160, which is a C sharp, which is associated with the A note of the sun, right? Because it's just 400 times smaller and 400 times closer to Earth. So all of these are just geometric structures, just as Kepler and, and Newton had uh, prescribed that they would be. Now, while I've got this here, one of the other things I noticed after doing all the prime work was that all the mathematical constants have some sort of association with their geometry with other numbers. So for example, uh, if I took a circumference of 162 of a circle, it's going to give me segments of a diameter that will basically be doubling math. So the radius uh, in this case will be 25.75 and its diameter is 51.5. Now that 51.5, if I measure that and use that as 51 degrees and 50 minutes, that will come out to be exactly the slope angle of the Great Pyramid. So phi, right, 1618 or 162, comes out to be exactly, the diameter of phi is the slope angle of the Great Pyramid. So that's a math constant also, and it's relational to uh, phi divided by pi. Phi divided by pi, which is what this is, phi divided by pi, gives me the slope angle of the Great Pyramid for my diameter. And then all the subsets of that, the smaller and smaller segments, so the radius is 25.75, radius over two is 12.875, uh, radius over four is 6.44, radius over eight is 3.22, and radius over 16 equals 1.61. So we're back to a close relationship to phi, right? And we've only lost 0.01 in the process uh, going from this. And you could just say this is 1.62, right, times 10 to the uh, uh, times 10 to the second power. So now we look at this one, and this is related to the sun because, you know, the we're just now taking the geometry of a circle with a circumference of 432. Then it has a diameter of 137 and a half, which is the golden angle 
which uh, would be one minus little phi, so 0 0.618033987, and that gives us a ratio of 0 0.3819, which is, uh, multiply that by 360 degrees and you get 137 and a half. So this is just as much the golden number as the golden number itself. It's just the absorption of the golden number. And then each of these subsets would be mathematical constants as well. So you've got a diameter here, which is 68.75, which I posited must be a new constant that we just don't know. Um, it has also, uh, 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 you cut that in half, radius over two, 34.38. Cut that in half, you get 17.18, which is Euler minus one, that is a math constant. Then you have 8.6, which is relational to light, and Euler, my, Euler over pi, which is that 0.864 that I just showed you. And then 4.29, and we have a loss of this uh, basically 0.03, I guess, right? From 432 to 429. So I kept doing this with all numbers, you know? I was just trying to see what I could find you know, that would be relational. So for example, I found this one as well, which was 222.48, which if I divide that by 360, it gives me the golden numbers, 0.618. And then it gives me a diameter value of actually 70.7, which is actually equal to, I didn't even know this at the time, but it's actually equal to one over the square root of two. So one over the square root of two, gives me 70.7, well, that's amazing. So it's another math constant. So my, my thesis was is that at every wave separation, using basic geometry, every mathematical constant would emerge, okay? So now let me go ahead and show you where I'm going with this. So, we've talked before about squaring the circle, right? And what it means to square the circle, and there are two ways to square a circle. One way is what I call a first dimensional analysis of squaring the circle. And this was a problem that was worked on for literally hundreds, if not thousands of years by scholars and mathematicians alike. And what you have here is that in order to square the circle, and I showed you before how to do it through concentric circles and where the, cir where the square will finally overlap, that'll give you a perimeter and circumference match, right? So what you wanna do is you wanna find the square that has the perimeter, right? The sum of all of these sides that will be equal to the circumference of this circle. Okay, so the circumference of the circle is 27.23, uh, uh, 27.232 in this particular circle. And in order to, to do that, right, you, there's a number of ways to do it, but I found a, a, a shortcut way to do it also, uh, which actually works and it's perfect as well. And I just found this only a couple days ago. And that is I can take to find the length of the side, right? All I have to do is take the radius of the circle, right? In this case, it's, it's uh, 4.33. And I multiply it by pi over two, gives me the side length exactly of the square, the perfect side length. And so you're basically making a rational length out of an irrational value, okay? But, but it's, it works. So and then you get this perfect squaring of the circle so that the sum of each of its sides is equal to the circumference of the circle. I like to think of this as a first dimensional analysis. So you think about the first dimension, the first dimension is just a line, right? So the zero dimension is a point. The first dimension is a straight line. The second dimension, you would have an x-axis and a y-axis, right? So now you've got a cross-shaped thing. And then the third dimension, you have depth perception associated with it. So x, y, and then depth coming this way. And, and then the fourth dimension would be motion coming along that, uh, that, that field, right, of depth. And then the fifth dimension would also be motion going in multiple directions, so not necessarily in the same direction. So we think of the fourth dimension as solely be re being relational to time, okay?
Now, can time actually flow backwards or can it not flow backwards? And there's a big debate about that among physics circles. And so I analyzed this, and this is the way to look at a first dimensional analysis. Why? Because if I was, was gonna do a pure first dimensional analysis, I would take the length of the line and just do one long straight line, which is one dimension, and I could measure that line and I could wrap it up into a circle, right? Now, it's no longer just a pure first dimensional analysis, but by, by rolling it back into a circle, but if I roll it straight, it's a pure first dimension thing. I can do the same thing with each of the sides of the square. So I could basically just take each of the pieces of the square and make one long thing. And let's say that this was my perimeter of my square is now depicted in a straight format in the first dimension. Okay. Now a second dimensional analysis of squaring the circle would actually be something like this, which is gonna be, we're gonna match the area. Because in the first dimensional analysis, all we're doing is measuring the line. But in the second dimensional analysis, we have to now look at what's being contained within that line. What's actually encompassed within the circle and what's actually being encompassed within the square. So I call this the second dimensional analysis because now we have an X and Y axis and the square has to close, right? So, so the way we solve an area is simply by multiplying the side. If it's a perfect square, you square the side length and that becomes the area value. And so this is what the square looks like that matches the circle that has an identical area. But the, the circumference and the perimeter no longer match, right? So the perimeter is 30.7, the circumference is 27. So it's a lot larger perimeter than it is circumference, so that's not a match, but the area 59.01 matches and 59.01 matches over here on the square. Now, in contrast, last time I showed you the perimeter matches perfectly 27.23, the exact circumference, and it's the same circumference and perimeter. Now, Another interesting point, though, is that the area here on this first one, where the square is markedly smaller, is 59 versus the square being 49 or 46 uh, on this one. So the area is 46, which is a lot smaller than the area of 59 over here. So now I could also derive this just by knowing the area of the circle, which is just pi r squared, right? So I take pi r squared multiply it by uh, uh, the radius. So pi multiplied by the radius squared gives me this 59.01. The other way I could derive the square uh, would be to just simply take the circle area and multiply it by pi over four gives me the square area. Okay, so notice this is a smaller square. This is a larger square. This is a second dimensional analysis. This is a first dimensional analysis. So first dimensional, just straighten it all out into one line. Second dimension, we're actually measuring what's inside, not the lines themselves, right? So this was really perplexing for me because <clears throat> I wanted to look at why was it that Leonardo da Vinci squared the circle the way that he did? Because we're about to see this. So this would be the comparison of the two types. You have an area squaring the circle with the area of the circle, and you have a perimeter line, which is squaring the circle with the, with the circumference of the circle. Now, interestingly, starting out the center point here, where I look at these line overlaps, because everything in geometry matters, right? Greatly matters. So on the perimeter, where it's overlapping, the circle is right at 51, 0.8436 degrees, which is the slope angle of the pyramid. Hmm. And then where the area line is overlapping the circle is 61.8 degrees. And then of course, you know, just with any square, for it to be perfect, it should line right up to 45 degrees unless the square is moved down the page like Da Vinci did, which is what he did. He, he made it the square edge, the line on this side over here, down to the bottom of the circle. So then it would change the angle, but you'll see why that's important in a moment. So which, which way is better to square a circle? And maybe herein lies the big question of all. 
which is why in the heck was this such a problem for hundreds, if not thousands of years? And I don't think anyone ever looked at it this way, where they were saying, okay, there's two ways to square the circle. You can do it via area, you can do it via circumference, but any solution to square the circle must inevitably have to take into consideration both characteristics, the area and their circumference, shouldn't it? For it to be correct. Otherwise, I don't see how you could do it. And then do you arbitrarily select a position in between the two? That would be some sort of like Goldilocks zone or something to create a perfect square of the circle. So is it a first dimension that answers the question? Is it a second dimension? Or do all the dimensions have to line up inevitably? Well, so before I go to that, so what I did is I actually have, uh, this is certainly not an original, but I have had this on my wall for a long time. I have a few pictures of this, and so I wasn't ter too terribly concerned about it. And this happens to be an absolute scale drawing, uh, or copy, of, uh, of the original Vitruvian Man, right? And so Da Vinci left in here in backwards mirrored text, right, all of this stuff, of writing explaining how all these lines separate the human form, right? All these different lines that he made, the horizontal line right across the chest, right at the clavicle, right here at the bottom of the face, the nose, the eyes, you know, and the, and the forehead, and then these lines down here, he articulates what all these lines mean in this document. And my colleague, uh, Alan Green and I have done a lot of work on this. So I thought this would be a great opportunity because no one's ever really done true precision measurement of this before. Because believe me, I have looked. Let me try to move this out of the light here and you guys can hopefully see it better. There we go. So I did some precision measurement on this because this is exactly the exact measurement of the, the original. Okay, so what I did, and I'm not terribly concerned about having a few marks in it, so that's okay. So what I did is I took this, these handy little uh, you know, compass calipers type of a thing so I could use to measure, and I'm gonna basically put this right at the navel, right, as you see, I've got already a hole there for it, and I'm gonna take it out to the edge here because I want to see exactly what is the value of this radius, right? So I measured that because there's a lot of rumors about the circle not being perfect or the circle being perfect and the square not being perfect or the square not being perfect. And I'm like puzzled because I'm like, okay, there's no way that this could be a perfect squaring of the circle in either the context of area or perimeter. So what is Da Vinci trying to tell us? Because clearly he knows how to square a circle or at least come close to it. Maybe not mathematically accurate or whatever perfectly, like because it's a rational versus uh, rational numbers, the rational linearity of a square versus the irrational uh, nature of the curve or linear line of the circle. But I wanted to understand because if you actually take a perimeter of the square, right, it's gonna give you a square that ends about right there. It doesn't even come up to the line of the circle. And if you take the, the, the area version of the squaring the circle, it will go way up here, it's too big. Even though I've matched everything against this bottom line down here. Now, I believe that Da Vinci was very, very exacting, extremely exacting, in fact. And, and so what I wanted to understand is what was this? Now, of course, as I got into this, I was pretty stunned to find and, and I'll show you the methodology I used on this work. So I took these calipers, followed this method, and I, I wrote down here in as scientific a fashion as I could for my notes here. And what I did is I took, and I titled this the metrology analysis of the Vitruvian man using consistent methodology, precise compass, magnifying glass loops, measurement uh, in millimeters and confirm straight lines. And then I made conversions from the millimeters over into inches. And, and basically, because the, the unit of measure at the time was, was definitely, uh, there was something called the braccio and palms, but also inches were used for sure. So um, I basically took measurements of all these and I was pretty stunned to find out 
that to realize that the exact radius by measurement, which I can now confirm, is just a tiny, tiny hair fraction underneath 432. Now remember, 432 was the, was the tuning standard, so this would be 4.32 inches. And why did da Vinci do this exact size? It's kind of fascinating to me. Now, what does the man represent? In alchemy, now da Vinci was a Rosicrucian. And we know that, uh, now we know he went to Egypt. We know that he gave record of that uh, in this letter that he wrote to the Devet Dar of the Sultan of Cairo. But the Vitruvian man actually represents, and as does, as does the squaring of the circle in general, it represents the merger of masculine and feminine. It represents the merger of opposites into one. And so I was kind of um, curious, I guess, because I wanted to understand, okay, then if you go back into esoteric thought and wisdom, they would say that, of course, the moon represents the, uh, the moon represents the woman and the sun represents the man. And in ancient times, the term for the sun was Ra, because it was the sun god. Ra Deus. Deus has two meanings. It's uh, actually from a word called Deva, which means day in Sanskrit. And Deus also means deity or God. So the spelling means D-E-U-S. But there are multiple ways to spell it, like opus, day, etc. So radius is actually another way to look at the word sun god, which is, first of all, kind of mind-blowing for me. And the fact that he used the exact measurement in inches of 4.32 inches to represent this, knowing what 432 represents to me, absolutely represents the sun. Now, the man himself here is supposed to represent the sun god Ra in many other contexts as well, and the moon, strangely, would be represented somehow by the square. Now, why is that? Why is it that the moon would represent by the square? Well, because it's an opposite, right? In a sense, normally we think of the roundness of the circle representing the woman, but when the two take on this merge characteristic, they end up becoming merged into one and they flip their characteristics. So in this case, Ra, 432, is represented by the, uh, by the circle, ultimately because this is the ideal man, right? The ideal of mankind. It also is supposed to represent some deification, in, in a sense, of man. So I started analyzing all of this, and what I found was that da Vinci had made something very, very unique, which comes out to, if you look here at this line, this line is the line of the area, area matching. This would be the line of the perimeter matching. And so you've got this line in between, which is certainly not the perimeter matching and certainly not the area matching, that are, is the perfect squaring of the circle that da Vinci has put forward. So why would he do that? First of all, secondly, then you start taking on, when you start using these values, you start taking on all these numbers, start taking on incredible mathematical constant values, okay? And so I just got done doing another precision measurement on this one more time. And so here's what I was left with. So actually, it turns out, after many times measuring this, this is just coming out to exactly 4.319 inches, is exactly the radius of the, uh, of the circle that da Vinci drew. And that would then imply for us a value that is equivalent to 19 over 7 for the circumference, which turns out to be 27.14 inches for the circumference. That, that is a very, very close uh, approximation for the Euler mathematical constant.
which is 2.718, but the closest fraction representation of it is 19 over 7. And 22 over 7 is pi. We know that pi and Euler are working together uh, to, bound, to create a boundary condition on the number 3. Now, another thing I want to mention is that where his finger is pointing here is exactly to 51.84 degrees. That is the slope angle of the Great Pyramid. And, and what you have here is, I've just denoted that by writing this here, and this is actually the square that da Vinci drew, which slightly goes and overlaps the circle, right? And then you'll see where, where there's an overlap of the square and the circle, comes out to be exactly 54 degrees here, which is interesting, because that's another kind of splitting the baby, I guess. So then what I found was that if you take 4.319 and square that, then you get to 18652, which is exactly Euler over pi plus one, and that's giving me a very lightning close light speed measurement, okay? Um, then, so you've got the Euler number here, you've got pi embedded in this, so you just take this, divide it by pi, and you're gonna get the radius, so radius divided by uh, by by this equals pi, right? So radius divided by circumference. And, and then you start noticing that all of these numbers start matching up. Now, one thing that he did do that was very bizarre is that he drew the left part of this square just ever so slightly off. And so what happens when you do it the way that he did it, right, which is this line adjustment I did here, then you end up with a line from uh, here, so this side of the line, uh, from here to here, right, would be 4.98 inches or 12.65 centimeters. But then if you add that to this, which is 5.02, it adds perfectly to 10 centimeters. Now we have a 10 centimeter line here, which is weird in and of itself. And then it skews all of the average perimeter and averages. So what it's basically telling us, first of all, that there's got to be some very, very small adjustment made for whatever it is that he's trying to tell us, because I have to believe da Vinci was so deliberate on these things, he has basically left us a little bit of an encryption right here. So what I noticed in doing it this way is I come out to these numbers. The circumference versus the perimeter equals 27.14 inches versus the perimeter being 28.14 inches. So it's exactly one inch less circumference than the perimeter. Hmm. Okay. Then we have the circle area of 58.7 and the square area is 49.7, also nine inches. So that sort of begs this question of one and nine, which then come back to one. And this would be three times three equals nine, right? And maybe there's something related to this one and nine combining to 10. And the square root of one is not really just one. There's another way to do the square root of one. Another way to, to write the square root of one is to do something we discovered called the fractal root. So the fractal root is a different uh, way to look at square roots of numbers. So if I were to look at the square root of 10, right, the square root of 10 comes out to be 3.16227766, and it's an infinite irrational number, okay? If I take the square root of one, it's just one. Or it could be negative one, right? Could be negative one also, but let's just stay in this side of the number series rather than going into negatives. So what if I took two numbers, knowing that the, the universe doesn't really care where the decimal position sits so much, and just move that around because then I can just multiply it by 10 to the whatever power, positive or negative. If I multiply this by its next fractal down, which would be this divided by 10, Remember, squares of numbers are the same number series just multiplied by each other, right? So it's the same number series multiplied by each other. What we found is that there is a 
Another way to do this, called the fractal root, which looks like that, and it, I'll rewrite it for you. So it's basically square root of one, just like that. And what it means is you have two numbers that are identical in the number series, but they're separated by 10 times, and then it creates another relationship, okay? So you guys have probably been wondering, what's the importance of five, six, for example? Well, if I take the square root of pi, square root of pi equals 1.77245, also infinite. But if I take the fractal root of pi, finding the two numbers that are separated only by a decimal position that are identical, what is the fractal root of pi and what can it tell us about those numbers and their relationship to pi? Well, what it tells us is this, the fractal root of pi, right? And, and you can do fractal square, fractal cube, fractal fourth power, fifth power, you can do all powers, it always works. The fractal root of pi would be 5.605. Oh, five. So if I multiply 5.605 times 0.5, 5605, oh it comes out to 3.14, you know, 2. Now, isn't that interesting? Because here we have the hexapentacus, 5, 6. Because every number must be manifest always also in geometrical form. So there's a new way. So you just learned a new way to square numbers today. And this new way of squaring numbers tells us a lot about the geometry of those numbers. So an easy way to solve this is you simply take whatever number it is you want to find the fractal root of, right? So let's say I want to take the, the number, you know, 225, and I want to find the fractal root. What's the fractal root? And we wrote a paper on this uh, called The Theory of the Fractal Root of Numbers. It's on my website page. I want to take the fractal root of this number. I simply take 225, I multiply it by 10, I take that product, P, and then I square that, okay? So 225 uh, times 10 equals 2,250, right? And then I would simply take the square, uh, the square root of that number, right? And which I don't know off the top of my head. And 2250, then I would take the, 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 the number that I'm gonna get back as the answer, I would then separate it by simply 10 times, so divide it, take that answer, divide it by 10, I multiply those two numbers by each other, and they're gonna come out to the perfect number just like pi does here. Every time, there's, without exception, this will always work, right? So for example, you know, let's try a number that, uh, that everyone can do without having to use a calculator, right? So let's take, What's the fractal root of four? So if I were gonna take the square root of four, right? Clearly that's two, right? But if I wanna take the fractal root of four, I'm gonna basically take it and make it 40. Square root the number 40, which is gonna be six and some change, right? And I'm gonna take six and change, right? Uh, that's probably like, uh, let's call it 6.2 or something. 6.2 and change times 0.62 and change is gonna give me, um, uh, 0.62 is gonna give me the number four. Back to the original. So when we think about square roots, we always, always only ever thought about two would be the square root of four, but there's another number series that's identical that is matching the square root of four. The only difference is, is we move the decimal position one position over. And this works for cubing for every type of exponential analysis. So I think what da Vinci's trying to tell us here is not coincidental. The fact that he used 4.32 inches, or very, very close to it, um, is pointing us to this notion of sun and moon, the alchemical marriage of the red king and the white queen. And I teach all of this stuff in my work, uh, in, my, uh, in my course on Resonance Academy that is called uh, the etymology of number, as well as the language of light. And once you start to understand mathematics in a different way, you'll start to understand and communicate with your world differently, and you'll start to understand and communicate with time as well differently. We've talked about time before. 
So I wanted to bring you guys into what I'm working on right now related to Da Vinci. And uh, I wasn't working on this a few days ago, but all of a sudden it just triggered me. Something got in my brain about this relationship. And then of course I go and measure it and it's coming out to be the exact references for light speed and the sun and everything. And this is very similar to what we found on the cover of the sonnets by William Shakespeare, that these relationships and these mathematical constants in geometry were all showing up over and over and over again, without exception. So now let's go ahead and get to some drawing. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna try a different way to square the circle. Right, we're gonna do both of these ways and I'm gonna teach you Da Vinci's way to square the circle. Because by the way, when you look at Da Vinci's way of squaring the circle, it is something about it. I'm telling you, that's probably why this has been the most famous painting, uh, most famous of his works. Uh, I even read recently that it was more famous than, uh, than the Mona Lisa. As an icon image, it's been going around the world over and over and over again. So we'll start with our line in the center. And we're going to uh, square the circle all three ways today. We don't have to do the long form like we did last time. We're gonna do this an easier way this time. So I've already got this set to the measurement of Da Vinci. Okay, sorry I had a phone call come in. I don't know I'm getting so many phone calls today. All right, so this is already the measurement of Da Vinci's, so I'm gonna This is 4.32 inch radius. Okay, so now we have a nice circle. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned to you already that there was a way to, to square the circle that is the shortcut, right? So we'll, I'll show you, we'll mark off where the other places are right, and how to do it. Okay. So if we were gonna do the perimeter squaring, what we would do to find the, uh, the, the in order to, to do this correctly, first of all, we're gonna to have to draw a little line here to connect these two lines. Okay, so now let's connect those lines and let's do the same thing on the other side. Now, hopefully if you have a clear ruler like I have, you can use this as a means to get a perfect position. Okay, so what you do then is if you wanna draw a 45 degree line in between, right, on both sides of this, you just simply line up the line to make sure it matches up with one of these lines here and it's perfectly straight. And then it also lines up with your, with your little hole that you left from your compass. So that looks okay. So we're going to do this and you want to feel your pencil go through that hole as well to make sure that you got the exact right spot. And that's why I drew two lines like this so I can get both sides of my X at 45 degrees. Okay, now I'm gonna erase those lines because I don't need these lines for anything. Okay. 
but don't erase the um, don't erase the outer lines here. You need to keep those. So the ones that are outside the circle, the part that's outside the circle, keep those. You can erase the rest though. And it'll be obvious why those lines are important in a moment. Now, to square the circle, let's start with perimeter one. You guys already drew this out, but you did it in the long form. We're going to, we know that the, uh, we know that the circumference, right? And we know, we know we can solve it from the radius, right? So we know that the radius equals 4.32 inches. Okay. So now we're going to solve the length of the side, right, is going to be based upon uh, the side length. So let's just say side length, SL, equals the radius of the circle. So radius multiplied by the square root of pi. Okay. So that value is 1.77245, okay? So that means that if I wanna find the value of the side here, right, it's going to have to be, you know, 432, so it's about, um, it's gonna end up being, uh, this is for the perimeter, right? Perimeter matching. Sorry. I did that wrong. That was actually for the area. Let's start with the area one because I accidentally was on the wrong page there. Okay, so for the area, for the area, so let's just say this is one area. Okay, so for the area, to know the exact length of the, of the line, it's going to be the square root of pi times the radius. Okay, so a way to, to do that, right, would be to use the Pythagorean theorem. So because now we know... Okay, we can know what the SL value is. So SL is gonna come out to be 7.67 inches, right? And we're gonna now take that, and you're gonna do the Pythagorean theorem on this, which is, let's draw a little square here, of three by three. Okay. And so you know that 7.67 and 7.67 is going to give me some value, right? So I was going to match those up. So now this squared plus this squared equals result, right, C. And then I can take the square root of that number, and it's going to give me the answer for what my diameter value would be. Okay, so this is going to give me a diameter for a new circle that I can now use to solve this. So the value of that comes out to be, let's see if I put it on here. Okay. So using Pythagorean theorem, I now just figured out that it comes out to be this length right here. Okay. So I can match this. Now, and if I, at each of these point lines here, across this, across this, across this, across this. Now I can draw by connecting these dots across the center. This is going to give me a close to perfect second dimensional look at what squaring the circle would look like for this particular circle. So remember, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And then don't forget to cut the diagonal in half, right? So you, you take the square root of c squared, because you've got a and b, then you take that, you cut it in half, 
and that becomes your diameter value, then you use your compass to just draw a circle you know, where these points are right here. So now I can use this value. I can erase all this stuff around it. And I have just squared the circle using area as my measure, okay? And I achieved that simply by taking the radius, multiplying it by the square root of pi. Okay, then I did the Pythagorean theorem to find the value of C. I cut that value in half. It becomes a radius for a new circle. I use the compass to mark that circle. Then I, because I had these 45 degree lines in here, I can mark exactly where the square would be. So now I've got this squaring of the circle inside of the relational to the area. So that was the first was area. Now, if we do the second as perimeter, perimeter is like this. So we're gonna take, in this case, the radius. Okay, so this is area. And now let's do perimeter value. And this is gonna be the radius of the circle. the sun god, radius, radius, and I'm gonna multiply it by pi over two, is gonna give me the side length, okay? Now another way, if you wanted to skip this, you could technically, you'd find where these two lines would give you exactly that length, right? And you could skip having to find this exact value, but if you wanna do it right, you do it this way. So pi over two equals 1.5707, okay? So 1.5707. So now we're gonna take the radius and we're gonna multiply it, so 432. We're gonna multiply that by, a, uh, by this 1.5707. And that's gonna give me a value as well. Which value, and I don't have my calculator here to draw off the top of my head, but I know this length here, so I'll go ahead and just take this and it comes out to be 6.8 inches. So there's my 6.8 thing, 6.8. So then I can use the exact same means, right, to be able to, uh, to solve now, uh, I do the same thing. So 6.8 and 6.8, right? I square those, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. I cut that in half, and then that's gonna give me a new value, which is gonna come out to be this value right here. I'm gonna put it at the center. Okay. That doesn't seem quite right. So I can just mark these now along this line. And I can just now take each one of these and I can intersect this point and make sure that I'm lined up against the center here. And then this is gonna give me the perimeter squaring of the circle. teach this this way, where you take square root of pi for the area measurement and the pi over two for the perimeter measurement. So now we have a square that is exactly the perimeter. So this is perimeter. And this one's area. But da Vinci, he did something totally different, right? His value showed us a value of five inches. 
because you get a 10 inch diagonal. So five inches here. So Da Vinci's value is right here. So I'll just mark each one of these. Here we go. Now I've been working for the last few days trying to find the mathematical constant that connects all of these. You saw how I had that nine and one left over and there's gotta be some message in there, which I fundamentally believe. Um, and I think I'm really close to it now. Because there's a reason why Da Vinci split the baby. It's not exactly halfway. But I think it's a relationship that comes right back to five and six yet again. Okay, so the Da Vinci line is the one I'm gonna bold here because there is something special about it. I don't know what it is, but it is. It just looks better. And I believe what he did is he intersected the two dimensions with one geometry that transcended both dimensions. And I think that there's something very fundamental that relates to where we are and what we're doing right now that is about learning to transcend dimensional perspectives. So this is the Da Vinci line. Now, I'm going to bold the circle so we'll be able to see this reference point. I'm going to have to run out of time here now, so, but stay tuned. There's going to be more on this for sure. And thanks for all the comments also on the. Uh, whether or not I should do a, a show. There were very good comments and actually, I think I will probably do it, but I'm gonna do it only with absolute control over all the content. So, this is Da Vinci's squaring of the circle, this is the perimeter squaring of the circle, and this is the area squaring of the circle. Something really beautiful about this one. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks very much. Much love to you all. And we'll see you soon. Bye.